OK, so in this tutorial, I want to spend a little bit of time looking at this warning message and what we need to do to remove it. And then, as I mentioned in the previous tutorial, I want to spend some time looking at the getBeam method. Because here we're casting the object into a printer message. Since version 5 of Java, there are better ways of doing that now. In a previous tutorial, we saw that the application context had a close method on it. We also looked at the register shutdown hook method. Now we can call the close method direct. So if we did context.close, that's a valid thing to do. But there again, we have to wrap that up in all sorts of try catch statements. And there is a better way of doing that. In fact, there are two ways of doing it. The first way is to touch the crawler method, register shutdown hook. So when the JVM shuts down, it will automatically close the application context as well. So let's have that. There's also another technique we can use since Java 7, and that's called the try on resources paradigm. When we set that up, we can do something like this. We could do a try and wrap the creation of this resource, which is an application context, and then wrap it in curly braces, just like a try catch really. And on the catch part here, down at the bottom, I'm not going to do anything particularly special here. I'm just going to print out to the console the exception if one gets raised with a print stack trace. So we're pretty much covered here. If something goes wrong within our application, Java will call the auto close method for us on the context. And if our Java virtual machine closes down, the shutdown hook will get invoked and that will also do the close for us. That removes the warning because we no longer have a resource leak. OK, so for the remainder of this tutorial, I want to concentrate on this getBeam method. The version we're using here is that we pass in a name, or an ID, in this case printer, and it returns an object. And when it comes back from the getBeam method, the return type is actually object, or Java object. So we need to cast that into the message printer. Now this is fairly archaic now for Java. Spring also provides some more up-to-date methods. And what I'm going to do is copy this part paste it below here. We're going to use the context and get bean. The next one we're going to use is get bean and we pass in a name which is again the ID and also the required type. Now the required type is the message printer dot class. So give it the name printer and the required type is actually a class. Don't forget it's still a class even though it's actually an interface. So this does exactly the same as above, except the actual casting is done within the getBeam method for us. You can see that running by right click on the on the main and do run as Java application. Now it prints out hello world. Now the next way of calling getBeam on the context, we're not actually going to pass in a name or an ID. We're going to rely more on the actual required type. I'll just show you what that means. So getBeam. It's actually this one here. So we pass in a, a class of type T. So we pass in the actual message printer dot class. So what's actually going on here? Well, within the application context, at this point, all the beans we have configured within our application.xml file have been instantiated. So they're all sitting around in a container waiting to be used. These previous methods of getBean have actually used the ID to do a lookup, whereas the lookup here is actually done on the message printer class type. What Spring's doing is basically saying, well, have I got any instances of managed beans or objects that are of this type? And if so, if there is one and only one, I'll return that. The only problem arises is if you have more than one instance. For example, if we had a setup where we had a printer, and we also had a printer2 ID, so we had two instances of the actual message printer, this wouldn't work, and it would throw an exception. This is very useful because it cuts down our reliance on passing strings in, which act as names and IDs. We can just rely on the actual type, and this helps for compile time checking. It's also used a lot in what's called auto-wiring, 
and we'll be looking at part two of the course. And you'll be surprised that on many large projects that you only tend to have one instance of a particular type of a class in your container at any one time anyway. And that will become clearer as we go on throughout the course. In the next tutorial, we're going to start looking at setter injection and constructor injection. We've already seen setter injection used without realising it. But we're also going to take time out and look at constructor injection and see what the differences are and why would you use one and not the other.